I'm Oscar. And I'm Dan. And today we're in country 98 Tunisia. Previously on Oscar and Dan. And then you find this. Eight-year-old Dan is freaking out right now. This is so cool. Look, it's wood. It's wood, yeah. After exploring everything from the abandoned Star Wars sets to the Chibika Oasis around the South Tunisian town Tuzo, we started making our way up to the capital Tunis. However, since the drive was over 8 hours, we decided to break up the trip just like we'd done on the way down to the desert, stopping first in Tunisia's secondary city of Svax. By the way, if this is the first time you see our faces, our names are Oscar and Dan, and we travel around the world full time, currently nearing our goal of visiting 100 countries. Now, after almost 5 hours in the car, we made it to Sfax. <laughs> Bonjour from Sfax, the second biggest city in Tunisia. It is such an amazing day. The trip so far, it's been great weather every day, but today it's a little bit cooler. Yeah, it's almost like it feels jacket weather. so nice. So we have a few hours here to explore. We stayed overnight to break up our super long road trip from Tuzo back to Tunis. Even yesterday was four and a half hours. Yeah, so even that was stretching it. <laughs> and it's another three hour drive today. So let's explore. Oscar somehow slept really well last night, but I had one of the worst hotel nights I've ever had. The air conditioning in our room wasn't working, so we ended up sleeping with the door open, but our hotel is right next to a nightclub playing the loudest music all night, and people were singing along. It was like we were in the nightclub with the screams because the door was open also. Mosquitoes kept coming in, so I was being bitten all over my body, and you know at night, the feeling when you wake up covered in mosquito bites? Like, Panic. Just like it was just really horrible, so I tried to close the door then the room became like an oven then at 2 a.m finally the club closed i took a lot of melatonin so thank you melatonin for helping me <laughs> So if you haven't seen our vlog from Cairo, on, we really love the old Medina there. Since this is the second biggest city, I'm assuming the Medina will be even bigger. Who knows if it competes in terms of beauty, but it's always so exciting when you get to enter old city walls like this. At this point, we've been to so many of these like old Medinas turned markets that we can't even count them anymore. But I remember the first time that we ever went to one of those and that was in the old town of Muscat, Oman, back in 2017. And I remember back then how amazed I was by everything. I was like, wow, all these spices, all this clothing, everything was just so like new and exotic to me. And so I'm trying to tune into that feeling right now, not the more experienced version of Oscar who's already seen this a million times. <laughs> but I was just thinking as we walked in here, I was like pinching myself a bit. When you think about the fact that this is our 98th country, like we're really almost at 100. It's pretty We've rude. been to more than half well, the countries in the world. Yeah. So yeah. It's pretty, yeah. ludicrous. The dangerous harissa chilies. We found the fruit and veggie part. I don't know if we'll buy anything, but it's always fun to see. Of the entire fruit market, pomegranate season. It's really sad how many people you see throw their trash on the street. We saw it a lot the past few days in the countryside, which is one thing because, of course, there's no real trash system there. But in the second biggest city, I've seen so many people throw whatever they're holding just on the sidewalk with no regard at all for what's going to happen to it. Need to watch your stuff. Take a detour. <laughs> also need to watch out for whatever's going on over there. Fire. Okay, let's keep it this way. Okay, let's run. What is going on? <laughs> look, look, look. The trash in Sfax really is on fire. <laughs> Literally. It's such a shame because it's so beautiful here. Like. Mine look at these the palm trees, look at this, yeah. how amazing. The old city wall, you have the beautiful palm trees, and then this is just like ruining it. Come on, guys. 
This is not gonna mean much to most of you, but if you're Swedish and you've been to Gotland, which is like an island uh, in the Baltic Sea, the biggest city there is called Visby. And they have a very similar style, like old city wall. It's like Gotland, but make it the Middle East slash North Africa. This is our hotel, the Occidental. Not amazing, not terrible, I did the job. Although, like we said, the location right next to that nightclub on a Friday evening was not ideal. <laughs> That's the nightclub, or one of these two, I think. <laughs> Wait, I didn't get that. <laughs> so now we start the drive up to El Jem. It was so weird. When we were getting into our car, this guy comes up to us and he's like, where's my money? And we're like, what? He's like, I cleaned your car. And we're like, we didn't ask you to clean our car, but we could clearly see it once he said it. Like the car was beautiful. We're like, this, it's a, this is a rental car. We don't care if you clean it. So in any case, we ended up giving him some money, but um, yeah. I guess to them here, it's kind of like, it's part of the deal. You stay at, I, I mean, this is not a fancy hotel by any means, but I guess it's like one of the upper ones in the city. So then it's like, oh, if you park here, that's like an added sort of charge you have to give to the community, I guess. But that like, makes it's, just, no it's sense. just, I don't know. Like, I feel like if anything, the better the hotel, the more they should prevent their guests from being scammed, but okay. On our way up to the capital Tunis, we drove past what we thought was one of the coolest stops in Tunisia, the amphitheater in El Jem. Holy moly. Wow, oh my oh god. Oh my god. This is what we came for. <laughs> so as Dan mentioned earlier, on our way to Tunis, we're doing a stop here in El Jem. Tunis. Isn't this Rome? That was actually our first trip. Our first ever trip was to Rome. And now we're back. A full circle moment. Yeah. We're back after all these years. The Colosseum, the coolest place in the world. It's super cold here in Rome for some reason. So despite what Dan is trying to fool you into thinking right now, we are here by El Gem, which is the biggest amphitheater in Africa. And actually Tunisia used to be part of a province in the Roman Empire called Africa, which has given the name to the entire continent. So this is one of the most well-preserved Roman ruins on the entire continent, which is really cool. So let's check it out. inside me at the people who would be sitting watching someone coming out here fighting a fruitless fight for their life like imagine just being sent onto this pitch and all these people are just sitting up there entertained like well, when... also i think there are actually people down here oh under so we can thing. go down yeah down yeah. in the dungeons where the lions would hang out i assume wow entering the dungeons down once more. oh my god the Colosseum is nothing on this, honestly. Yeah, this is cool. Sometimes I think you can get a little too political or a little too like politically correct about the past, but isn't it kind of weird to think how us humans love to explore all these sites that we like slaves? Which is like, oh, that's so amazing. Not only was this place built by slaves, but it was also but it was also built to have slaves battle it out against like lions and tigers for the entertainment of the upper class. It's crazy to think how old this place is though, because this was built in the third century, in the 200s. Just thinking about all the different eras of history that this has lived through and that this has found different purposes through, it's just pretty crazy to think about that. We got our orchestra seats for 50% off by using today tapes. <laughs> Wow, the shade. Also, I mean, it's not like there's no people here, but definitely like a tiny fraction of what you would find at the Colosseum. <laughs> All 
right, so we decided that before we go in and explore Tunis, we're actually gonna drive about an hour and a half further north to see something pretty exciting. As we continued the drive further and further north toward the Mediterranean coast, the landscape started changing dramatically with lush green trees replacing the arid desert. I love how Oscar was like, it's kind of exciting, I think. <laughs> we are actually somewhere very, very special. Africa, is Africa the world's biggest continent? Asia is. Oh. Africa is really big, <laughs> mind you. <laughs> After all these days in the desert, it feels really weird to be by a beach. Whenever we are in a place like this, I always get the same feeling. I have to go in for a swim. <laughs> There's no way I can avoid it. So that was the northernmost tip in Africa, although you could barely hear us. Oscar is really a water creature. He swims wherever and whenever he can. I am sort of the opposite. I don't hate water, I love snorkeling, but I'm very picky about where I do it for some reason. I get kind of eked out by it, and here there were tons of jellyfish, which really freaks me out. Even Oscar was a bit like, oh, in and out. And now we are driving down to probably the most iconic or famous place in Tunisia with tourists, which is Sidi Bose. It's supposed to be a really beautiful little coastal town. So we have an hour and a half drive now. This is the trip of driving, so I can't think of a better trip to get such a fancy car for the first time. There's a bit of traffic. They are going wild. Our vlogs from Tunisia are so like one place to the next, which is really what this trip has been like because we have been going around to a new part of the country literally every few hours. So now let's explore probably the most iconic part. I mean, I hate to compare Sidi Bou Said to Greece because I feel like Tunisians get that comparison all the time, but it really does feel like we've been transported to, albeit a bit different version of Greece, but still, that's what it feels like. I say we could count the number of foreign tourists we've seen so far on this trip on two hands, but now we've already seen probably more combined than we have in the entire last week. And talk about a difference from the past few days. Like, we've literally, like Dan said, seen no tourists whatsoever, almost. And now it's like, this is the main site. Like, imagine if we'd come here first on our trip to Tunisia, like how different our perception of the country and the trip would have been. Like, it's crazy how the order in which you do a trip can really affect your perception of the country. By the way, this totally wasn't planned. <laughs> Wow, imagine living there with that view. Wow. Imagine living there in this house or whatever this is. Look at this balcony. I can't even imagine how epic to wake up every morning and see that view. I can really see why this has become such a tourist site, honestly. It is so, so beautiful. And they've really gone all in on the white and blue theme. There's no deviation from it. <laughs> Most beautiful place in Tunisia? I think so. Here it looks a hundred percent like California. Okay, like, maybe not this, but okay, maybe not. <laughs> like, like maybe a, pile, not the wire. a pile of barbed wire. <laughs> yeah, but apart from that, just looking out over the ocean, this road right here. It feels like a completely different country from what we've been driving through uh, over the past few days. Like it totally just feels like, how can this be the same country, you know? It's 
just well this is turning into a bit of a meme because we always compare like places to California. But I think such a major part of why I find this so beautiful is because it reminds me of California and I think we're just dying to go back. Maybe we to need to go, go back. We're dying to live there, but the <laughs> rent will kill us. So yeah, we're dying to go there, but we'll also die if we go there. Let's manifest it. In a few years, yes. we can settle down there. Okay, first of all, it's so cute and calm here at night. And secondly, we found a little local patisserie with some vegan sweets that we're gonna try at our hotel. All right. All right, Babs. Bye. It's time to try these little uh, pastries we got. In it? This was not green in the store. I, I think it's just a different lighting. <laughs> Honestly, we don't know what anything is, but... A lot of pistachio and almond stuff, mm -hmm. I think. They yeah. just happen to be vegan. Mm. It's like pistachio marzipan. I love this, like, just mm. mountain of pistachios. Mm. 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 That's so good, right? mm. mm. They taste great, but they're all basically the same thing in different shapes. Mm. In case you didn't know, I don't think I've ever mentioned it on this channel. I have misophonia, which is basically an emotionally dis proportionate response to sounds. It's like completely silent right now. Usually it's very good when we're eating if there's some sort of sound because the more I like someone, the more it bothers me. With the chewing, <laughs> the chewing sounds, especially. it's so annoying. But Google or look on YouTube about misophonia because it's a real thing. And it's very, very frustrating. Chewing sounds and sometimes <laughs> breathing. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna have to say that the people that live with people who have misopho misophonia also suffer actually because we have to change a lot of our behaviors. I'm gonna go chew this last one over here in the corner. No. Bye bye. Please. <laughs> chew, chew, chew. Good morning. We are back close to City Bosaid, a little bit further south in Carthage. A Carthage. Very Carthage. We just took a taxi here today because we're going into Tunis town later and we don't want to drive there if we don't have to. Avoiding driving in a city is always preferable. Yes. In my humble opinion. <laughs> I think we should do hats off to both of us because on this trip, we've seen not one, not two, but three of Tunisia's UNESCO World Heritage Sites, which I think is pretty good going. Have we, how many have we seen in Sweden? One, zero? <laughs> Probably zero, to be honest. I don't even know what Sweden's UNESCO sites are, to be honest. Embarrassing. <laughs> Looks so cool. I know. Imagine this old like harbor right here. Wow. But we are right here with the baths of um, Antoine, Ant Anton, 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 <laughs> uh, Antonios. It's so cool walking around these ruins and trying to imagine the grandeur of this place back in the day. So let's show you around and tell you the history of this fascinating place called Carthage. Carthage used to be one of the most important cities of classical antiquity. It was originally founded by Phoenicians who came here from the Levant, and this civilization that they founded here came to completely dominate the western part of the Mediterranean. So the Carthaginians were growing increasingly powerful, but there were a few people just to the north of here that didn't really like that. More specifically, of course, the Romans, who absolutely didn't like that Carthage was getting more and more influence over the Mediterranean. So the Romans came here and fought a series of three different different wars called the Punic Wars, where they absolutely leveled the city to the ground. And after that, to make matters even worse, because the Romans can't just, you know, level your city with the ground, they also gotta add salt to the wounds. Quite literally, because they put salt all over the soil here to make it basically infertile. However, after conquering Carthage, the Romans built their own city here and incorporated it into their empire, which is when they built the amphitheater in El Gem that we saw earlier, for example. This ticket gets us into every side in Carthage. It was 12 dinar, which is not bad. I wonder what else we can do with these. <laughs> They're like Willy Wonka's golden tickets. Exactly. The magic ticket of Carthage. All around Tunisia as we've been driving, we've seen these numbers on a bunch of different walls, like throughout the entire country. If someone from Tunisia could let us know what this means, that would be great, because we still haven't figured it out. So 
So do you guys remember that ring shaped port from the map? This right behind us is it. It doesn't really resemble what we saw on the map obviously, but it's so cute. This little like circular oasis of calm and all these boats and Carthage is really nice. And now it's time for our last stop in Tunisia, which is Tunis, <laughs> which is pretty interesting that we're finishing off our entire trip with the capital, but that's how we're doing it today. And just like that, we made it into the city. It's pretty great. I think the most fascinating thing at this point, since most Medinas are very similar, is more looking at the people and what they're doing and how they're interacting with each other. That's what teaches you something more about the specific country. Because yeah, you can buy these things at most Medinas around the world. Even here, there's no tourists compared to Sidi Bousse, so it's quite interesting. What the hell is this? I have to ask the seller, why do you have photos of Hitler? He said, many clients want photos of Hitler and Saddam Hussein. And then he went, Hitler. Did he say that? Yeah. That encounter made me Google something I never really thought about before, we didn't learn about in school, the connection between the Arab world and Nazi Germany. Obviously, there's a lot more reading to do, but it's interesting because being a former French colony here, it seems like the countries that were colonized by the UK or France sort of took Germany's side since Germany was against the UK and France and these countries wanted independence. Of course, there's also the shared anti-Semitism. So it'll be interesting to read more about that because this is a topic I haven't really been exposed to before. I never thought about. I don't care what your history is, but selling pictures of Hitler and like actively promoting what he was and what he stood for, is just outright appalling, like no matter yeah. what the history is. That encounter left us very jarred and we couldn't help feeling both wary and angry as we walked the last few streets of the old Medina. It's more important than ever to stand up toward bigotry and hate. And while we normally stay out of politics on this channel, this was something we just couldn't ignore. We truly hope this man's opinions aren't representative of the general Tunisian sentiment. Sadly, that was the last thing that happened on our trip to Tunisia. That was before we had a pretty dramatic experience getting out of the country as well. Okay, we've had the most stressful travel day in a long time. Oh, uh, we'll tell you all about it later. And if you want to hear about one of the most stressful days of our lives, keep watching. If not, we love you guys and hope we'll see you soon for our videos from country 99 and then finally 100 coming very soon. Now. For the story. So let's tell you what happened yesterday. It was not very fun. No. Our flight was at pretty much 3 p.m. and we aimed to leave our hotel at 12.30. We were only a 10 minute drive from the airport. Things got a bit delayed so we ended up like leaving our room at 12.55 at which point Oscar went to check in or to check out <laughs> and I went to load the car. So I go down to checkout and we're already quite squeezed on time, right? So the first thing that happened was that the checkout process took a lot longer than expected for a bunch of different reasons. So by the time I got down to the car, we were already very, very stressed. And obviously since we had the rental car, we would have to fill up the gas tank before returning it. So we left the hotel about 1.05 or so. We sped to the gas station and like, Traffic was crazy at that specific time for some reason, even though it was the middle of the day. Oscar was like swerving between cars. It's and crazy. in the car, I was like, okay, you have your passport, right? And like the routine like, question. Yeah, just like making sure we have our passports, everything. And Oscar was like, I don't know. I was like, I literally haven't seen it since we got to this hotel in Tunis. So we started arguing a little bit. We get to the gas station. And of course, this is one of the first gas stations we've been to on the trip that really doesn't take cards. So they're like, we have an ATM here. In the meantime, Oscar is like frantically searching. I'm pulling out all the suitcases, like searching through all of them, trying to find my passport. And I was like, I literally can't find it anywhere. I was like opening them on the pavement. Everyone around me was like honking at me, like move out of the way. In the middle of all this, Dan is like, okay, we need to withdraw money like from the from the ATM. And so I run over to the ATM. It's out of order, so I can't withdraw the money. And we're like, what are we gonna do with this payment for the gas? So I was like, please, we have to pay with card because I saw they had a card machine. They were like, fine. So they took a huge premium for using an international card. But we had literally no choice because at that point we couldn't find his passport. So we thought we have to go back and check in the hotel room. So we 
speed back to the hotel through this insane traffic. Oh wait, we should also mention that at that point, like right as we were about to leave, a car pulls in in front of us, like face to face like in, at um, the gas station. Yeah. So we couldn't get past it to get to the hotel. So instead we had to take another exit, which took several minutes longer. No, to because drive. we had to, so we had to reverse back and then another car was there. And so yeah, we had to like really, fight with him to get out sort of. It was, it was really like, chaos. Oh. Then we were speeding back to the hotel. Oscar ran in. I was like, okay, it's my turn to search all the suitcases. So I pulled out his big suitcase. I was checking, ev like I pulled out every <laughs> single piece of clothing, checking the pockets, just every corner of his suitcase. Then I took out mine and like, why would his passport be in my suitcase? I was checking every single pocket of everything. Then I was like, could it be in my carry-on? So I was searching that as well. In the meantime, I was running into the hotel and I went straight to the reception. I was like, please, please, please. I need a key card for our room because I think I lost my passport in there. And I run up and I literally search every nook and cranny of that room. And I was like, it's not here. It is definitely not here. So, so and, and that, at that point, I was like, pretty sure I'd lost my passport. I was like, it's not here. There's no way. Yeah. So again, the flight was actually at 2.55. I think at this point it was about 1.20. We were starting to get it really close. Finally, I was like, okay, I'll just search through Oscar's carry-on since naturally that's what he searched, right? At the gas station. I open it. I So there's like two sides. I check one side it's not there the other side i open the pocket and it's literally the first thing i see and i'm like are you kidding me and it turns out i put it there which is a stupid thing the thing is i would have never put it there i knew not to look there because i would have never put my passport like i know where to put my passport in the carry-on i know what my routine is yeah we so. so we both made a big mistake i put his passport in there because we always hide our passports from housekeeping somewhere so i was just like okay i just need to put it somewhere quickly where they can't <laughs> really see it but then again i was like of course oscar searched through his carry-on like why wouldn't that be the first place he searched so at that point oscar came down and we're both like, what the hell? Like yeah. so pissed. And then we were speeding to the airport. Luckily, so only 10 minutes away. So Yeah, so we got there at about 1.35 actually. So then we had to drive into the airport parking to return our car. And you know, like many parkings, you have to take a ticket and the, the thing goes up. Of course, the one we drove into <laughs> was broken and Oscar was like trying to figure it out. So I got out of the car, I was investigating the other ones and I realized this is just the one that's not working. So then Oscar had to reverse stock out. and go into the next one and the crazy thing was that like you know usually there's some sort of signage towards like the car rental return parking lot but there was nothing like that so i was like where do i go to return the rental car the traffic inside the parking lot was insane i was like how am i gonna get through this yeah. and i had to drive all the way down to the airport like around and back to get to the car rental return. In the meantime, since I'd gotten out of the car to check on the entry, I was running to like the section of the car park where they had told us to park, but every single spot there was taken. And I was like, <laughs> oh. are you kidding? What are we going to do now? So luckily, since it took Oscar a few minutes to get there, by some miracle, the only stroke of luck we had during that entire day. No, actually, there, was, there were two strokes of luck. This was the first one. Okay, yes, this was the first. <laughs> luck and a lot yeah. of bad luck a car pulled out the second oscar was coming it was kind of funny because she literally <laughs> slammed right into this huge pole like she just sped like yeah. speed reversed into a pole she looked she was I mean, completely like what am i doing yeah. and oscar was just like we don't have time to like no. take consideration for you like she was still <laughs> no trying nice to figure out the pole and it was just like Rrr! swerved yeah. into the spot i mean under <laughs> normal circumstances i would have stopped and like are you okay <laughs> like is your car okay I like mean, obviously it was, everything was okay it was yeah. just like maybe the car got like a little bit dented or bumped. something so we get out of the car and uh luckily this man who like works for the car rental company comes up and he like collects the key and then he's like oh i need the um, ticket you got when you enter the parking lot and of course in my stress I have completely just like thrown it out somewhere. I have no idea where it is. And I was like, oh my God. And so I had to like rummage through our bags once again. And I realized that I put it in one of the carry-on bags. <laughs> And so I hand it to him. So that was an extra two minutes of yeah. trying to find that. So at this point, I guess it was about 140. Checking clothes is at 155. So we are hauling to the terminal. The car park was quite far from the terminal. We're hauling there in the sun. Like we were wearing quite a lot of clothes. <laughs> yeah. Just like, Ooh. then of course, as is very common in North Africa and some countries in this region, there's security to even get into the terminal. So there was a line for that. We're like, oh my God, just get us to this check-in desk, get us to this check-in desk. We get through that finally at pretty much 
145. So we speed up these escalators and we're looking on the monitors like, where is the Emirates check-in? There were no signs for the check-in desk. So it said like check-in desks are these numbers, but there were no signs anywhere for how to get there. And that minute or that second even, I see two people walking by with Emirates lanyards. I'm like, how perfect is this? I go, excuse me, where's Emirates check-in? He goes, what do you mean? Emirates check-in is closed. We go, what do you mean? It can't be closed. It's more than an hour until departure. It closes 90 minutes before here. I literally told him, are you kidding? He goes, why would I be kidding? I'm the station manager. I've seen before, like many times actually online, reading different check-in deadlines that in certain countries, check-in will close 90 minutes before. It's usually places where I guess the airport is so chaotic that people need more time to get to the gate, but we have never encountered it. I mean, in 98 countries, no. it has never been the case before. And we didn't get any emails from Emirates. It wasn't in our confirmation email I checked. I couldn't even find information that it closed 90 minutes before on their website. I'm sure it's out there somewhere, but there was no way we could have known so we were like, so what now? And he was like, which one of you is Dan? Which one is Oscar? <laughs> And we were yeah. like, obviously he had seen that we were the two passengers that hadn't yeah. arrived on the list. So he was like- And he's like, why are you this late guys? Yeah. Like, it's a long story. We felt so, so bad. But... So he and his really pissed colleague agreed to check us in. So we went to check in and thankfully we managed, even though it was like one hour and five minutes before departure. Of course, at that point, the luggage belt broke. <laughs> <laughs> the entire luggage belt. So yeah. there were like 12 check-in desks for different airlines. No bags were being sent. And we were like, great, yeah. let's just, why not leave our bags in Tunisia? So while Dan's doing that and like handling the luggage, I run down to the rental car office because we still had to like sort everything out with the deposit and stuff. And so they were waiting for like probably a good 15 minutes for the guy outside in the parking lot to call them to like say that everything was okay with the car. And so I was standing there like, sorry, I like really need to leave. Like at this point, Dan is standing upstairs with the Emirates guy and the guy is like, okay, you really need to go through immigration like right this second. And I'm like, I'm waiting for that confirmation. Yeah, so in the end, Oscar just like had to haul out of there. At this point, it was about two o'clock. So we go through immigration or well, we go to immigration Immigration. The lines were crazy long. So like I'd say in our line there were 20 people in front of us on yep. one agent. He was really taking his time. So we were like Oh god, oh god, oh god. Finally, we got to the front. No, literally, one guy is standing yeah. in front of us. As this guy walks up to the agent in the booth, the guy's computer breaks down. I mean, we couldn't tell the computer broke down. He just stood up and started like playing with all these wires. He was looking <laughs> at the computer next to it, trying to figure out if he could start that up. We were like, er. at this point it was 2.20 and boarding closed at 2.35. So we were like, <laughs> we really don't have time for this. Thankfully, there was a really nice man in the line next to us. He was like, please, please go ahead. I know the stress. So thankfully, that could handle quickly. The agent in that line was so much quicker also than the one in the line we've been standing in. Yeah. I mean, it's always bad luck if you end up with a line. Like the speeds with immigration officers can be so, so different. Yeah. But anyway, like literally like when that happened, when the guy's computer broke down, I was like, someone is playing a trick on us. Yeah. Right? Like what is going on? It really was like that. We thankfully security was pretty quick. None of our bags got searched. I was like, mm. our bags are definitely getting searched. Yeah, and that we, was me too. <laughs> we ran to the plane. We were the last on board, but we made it. We're not huge drinkers, but the flight attendant was like, you guys like some champagne? We were like, Yes. So that was our very <sighs> stressful day. Our two stories of luck were the parking spot and of course and running maybe, into the Emirates the station, manager. station manager. Freaking station manager. Because if we had not been there at that second when he passed, we wouldn't have gone on the flight because yeah. we would not have been able to find the check-in desk. He would have been gone. So yes, some lessons learned. Always, always, always keep track of your passport. Of course we do, but now even more than before, I don't think we'll ever forget again to check where our passports are. And also not putting the other person's passport where they don't know where it is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we just changed carry-ons, which is part of the problem yes. because our old routines were sort of disrupted. <laughs> Another lesson we learned is when you have a rental car, we always cut it too close when we have rental cars because yeah. it's like we're thinking we're taking a taxi. In fact, you need like at least a half an hour extra yeah. to deal with that stuff. Those are the two main takeaways and that for some reason, <laughs> Tunis Airport's check-in closes 90 minutes beforehand. Keep but, that in mind. Um, yeah. <laughs> but now we're very excited excited to be here in Dubai for a couple days before heading to our 99th country. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, we're so yeah. getting so ridiculously close. Okay. It took us a while to relax, but we were just so happy and relieved that everything worked out.
Uh, and that's part of full-time travel. This is the stuff that happens on the adventure to 100 countries. Yeah. I can't even imagine the adventure to every country in the world. But I guess on that note, till we see you next time. See, see you around, around the world. world. <laughs>